Hey everybody, welcome to the anatomy video lecture series. Uh, today we're going to start our next system, which is going to be the respiratory system. And uh, we're going to talk about the difference between the upper and lower respiratory tract and then start uh, going into what is actually in your upper respiratory tract. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, everybody, today we are going to begin talking about our next system, which is going to be the respiratory system. So let's go ahead and begin. Structurally, the respiratory system is divided into upper and lower divisions or tracts. You have your upper respiratory tract, which is going to consist of the nose, the pharynx, which is the section of tube that's uh, basically the back of your throat and it will run from the back of your nasal cavity to the back of your mouth all the way down to your larynx or your voice box and that was would consist of your upper respiratory tract now if you've ever gone to the uh, doctor and they tell you you have an upper respiratory infection uh, that is an infection that's going to be located in that area which would be, again, uh, the upper respiratory tract, let me turn my pin on, would be from here up. So here is the larynx or voice box. So all of this area is going to be the upper respiratory tract. The lower respiratory tract, and again, if a physician tells you that you have a lower respiratory infection, we're dealing with the larynx and down. Anything from the voice box uh, into the trachea, the bronchial tubes, or the lungs would be considered uh, in the lower respiratory tract. Air passing through the respiratory tract will go through the nasal cavity, the pharynx, the larynx, your voice box, the trachea, a.k.a. your windpipe, your primary bronchii, okay, so trachea is this tube here, and your first branch off of the trachea is going to be primary bronchii. When it branches a second time, that's going to be secondary bronchii. And then the time that it will branch off of that would be considered the tertiary bronchii. At that point, the bronchial tubes are going to be small enough that they don't need the rings of cartilage for extra support to keep them open, and they're referred to as bronchioles. Um, and it will branch out repeatedly until it ends up in what I call the cul-de-sac of your airway, and that is the alveoli. The alveoli are tiny air sacs at the end of your respiratory tract, where gas exchange takes place. And we'll talk a little bit more about them uh, in later unit in the later in the unit, but there are about 150 million of these tiny air sacs in each of your lung, totaling up to around obviously then 300 million alveoli total. And they're very obviously very small. And this is where oxygen will leave the atmosphere and enter your bloodstream. And we'll get a little more detailed uh, as the unit continues. The pharynx is a hollow tube that starts posterior to the internal nares. Your internal nares are basically the, your nostrils. It's just an anatomical term for uh, the, the nostril. And they will descend to the opening of the larynx in the neck. So that is your pharynx. We will find out that it is going to have three subdivisions based on uh, which area of the pharynx we are discussing. It is made of a complex arrangement of skeletal muscle that assist in deglutition. And for those of you who are unclear what deglutition is, that is a fancy anatomical word for the act of swallowing. It functions as, number one, a passageway for food and for air. So both 
Um, there are two thirds of your pharynx that will function both in digestion and respiration, meaning food will pass through this tube. It is a resonating chamber for our speech. So if you have ever spoken with a, uh, a horrible cold and you have terrible congestion, or if as a kid, you know, you would hold your nose and talk and laugh because you thought it sounded funny, uh, you would realize that uh, your pharynx is a resonating chamber for our speech. And if you prevent air from passing through there when we talk, it does alter the sound uh, of our of our voice. And we're set to have a very nasally voice if, if that happens. And uh, at the back of your mouth, you will have the part of your pharynx that will house your tonsils. The pharynx has three anatomical subdivisions, as I alluded to on the last slide. The section of pharynx right behind the nasal cavity is referred to as the nasopharynx. The section of pharynx behind your mouth is referred to as the oropharynx. And then the last little section that uh, where the pharynx joins the larynx is referred to as the larynopharynx for uh, obvious reasons. I hope we all realize why it is named that. In this graphic, uh, the slitting the muscles of the posterior pharynx shows the back of the tongue and uh, as it reaches the laro, larynopharynx. So this is the a cadaver. And imagine if you were to make a frontal plane right through the middle of their neck and you were to remove the posterior part of their body and look at the anterior section of that cut uh, from behind. This is what, so basically this is the back uh, looking at uh, the front of their throat from the back. So if you cut them open that way, if that makes sense. And so just to give you an idea of what we're looking at. So that means air and food would go right through here and head down this way. This is the back of the tongue. And this flap of tissue right here is referred to as the epiglottis. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the epiglottis later in the unit, but basically it is the protective covering of your trachea that will prevent food or drink from going down your windpipe and causing you to choke. And we'll definitely talk more about it, uh, especially when we get to the digestive system. The nasopharynx is separated from the oropharynx by the hard and soft palates. So if you remember from the skeletal system, uh, the uh, bone in the back of the roof of the mouth was called the palatine bone, and it represents the hard palate or the bony part of the roof of your mouth. And then the soft tissue that extends off of that is referred to as the soft palate, uh, where you will find your uvula, you know, when you open up and, and look in the back of your throat. And everyone calls it the quote unquote, the hangy down thing. Uh, but it's actually, its anatomical name is the uvula. The nasopharynx lies behind the internal nares. Again, those are the nostrils. It contains the pharyngeal tonsils and adenoids and the opening of the eustachian tube or auditory tubes. Your eustachian tubes are uh, small tubes that connect the middle ear with your nasal cavity. Um, this is why when you uh, gain elevation or lose elevation, your ears pop. There's a change in air pressure and the eustachian tubes um, equalize the pressure behind your eardrums with the atmospheric pressure. Uh, you also experience this when you dive. Uh, if you've ever gone, uh, if you've ever been swimming and dove down deep, you know, past 10 feet or at 10 feet, you may have noticed that uh, you can feel the water pressure pushing in on your eardrums. And what they, what scuba divers will do, and what I did uh, when we snorkeled in the Bahamas and we swam uh, down many times to 20, 30 feet deep, um, we would hold our nose closed 
and then try to blow air out of our nose. And then that air, the only place it could go was up the eustachian tube and go behind our eardrum, which increased the air pressure behind the eardrum and would match the water pressure that was pushing in on our eardrum. And that's how we would equalize. And uh, I'm sure I've told you the story of my single deep dive while snorkeling in the Bahamas where I swam to 63 feet. And I believe I equalized my ears four times on my way down to that depth. Um, so if you scuba dive, uh, you will also experience the same thing. And as you feel that pressure, uh, you take advantage of your knowledge of your eustachian tube and you equalize your ears by squeezing your nose and trying to blow air gently out your nose. If you do that now, the air pressure behind your eardrum will be greater than atmospheric pressure and it will be uncomfortable and you will need to yawn or swallow to get your ears to pop and that will then re-equalize your ears. So, you know, don't do that. Uh, the eustachian tube or auditory tube come off of it and travel into the middle ear cavity, as I just explained. The oropharynx lies behind the mouth and participates in both respiratory and digestive functions, since food will also go uh, in your mouth and then down your throat. The main palatine tonsils, those used taken in a tonsillectomy, so if you've ever had your tonsils removed, you no longer have the palatine tonsils, and small lingual tonsils are also housed in the oropharynx. The larynopharynx lies inferiorly or below and opens into the larynx or voice box and the esophagus. It participates in both respiration and digestive functions, which means air and food or drink will pass through the larynopharynx on its destination to either your stomach or your lungs. Hopefully air is going to lungs only and food only is going to the stomach. So here is a diagram that shows everything that's involved in that upper respiratory tract, you know, the nasal cavities. Uh, this is a cross section of, of, someone's, of someone's head. Uh, so you can see here at the tongue, it's attached to the epiglottis. So when the back of the tongue goes up, when you swallow, it pulls down on the epiglottis and it will cover the opening to your trachea so that food will go right down the esophagus. Uh, when we breathe, air will rush down into the epiglottis will be open and air will rush down into your trachea. Uh, this is why uh, your parents have told you uh, not to talk with food in your mouth. Um, not be, you know, because not only is it not very cordial to see someone, uh, their food in, in mid mastication, but also when you're talking, you're breathing and air is going in and out. And if your mouth is open while you're speaking and you're breathing and you have food in your mouth, um, sometimes, depending on what you're eating, that food can kind of get caught in that air current and it will then rapidly uh, head down your throat and get lodged right there at the beginning, right there underneath your epiglottis and will obstruct your airway. And then, of course, as we all know from health, that's when you give the universal sign of choking and you grab your throat. And uh, hopefully someone is there to either uh, smack you on the back or give you the uh, life-saving Heimlich maneuver. The larynx is composed of nine pieces of cartilage, forms a short passageway connecting the larynopharynx with the trachea, a.k.a. the windpipe. The thyroid cartilage is uh, also makes up part of the uh, voice box or larynx. Uh, this gives us what is called the Adam's apple. And, you know, everybody always says, oh, only because it's called Adam's apple, we think Adam and Eve and only men have Adam's apples. Um, this is not true. Uh, women also have a larynx, which is why they also have an Adam's apple. Um, clearly women can speak. 
So if they didn't have one, then they would not be able to talk. Uh, the reason a man has a more prominent Adam's apple is because a man's voice box is bigger. And this is what gives a man uh, his deeper voice. The larger voice box means larger uh, vocal folds. And if you think of a guitar and the strings that are on a guitar, the larger, thicker strings give the lower notes. And so that it's the same principle applies. Uh, the larger vocal folds will give a man his deeper voice as they speak in that, in that lower registry. That's why man's Adam apple, uh, Adam's apple or larynx is more prominent, especially if it is a man with a thin neck. Now I, uh, don't have a thin neck. So my Adam's apple is not as prominently visible because I got a big fat neck. And so it kind of hides uh, my quote unquote Adam's apple. Uh, for those of you who remember the skeletal system, hopefully this structure looks familiar. That is the hyoid bone uh, that we learned. And as you can see, it provides the top edge framework for the larynx. So let's go back to the thyroid cartilage is the Adam's apple. And the one below called the cricoid cartilage are landmarks for making an emergency airway called a cricothoroidotomy, um, also sometimes referred to as a tracheotomy, where they go in and puncture a hole in uh, hopefully below the larynx in an emergency to allow that individual to breathe. The epiglottis is a flap of elastic cartilage covered with a mucose membrane attached to the root of the tongue. The epiglottis guards the entrance of the glottis, which is the beginning of the larynx, the opening between the vocal folds. Uh, for breathing, it is held anteriorly, then pulled back toward to close backwards. For breathing, it is held anteriorly, then pulled backward to close off the glottic opening during swallowing. So the epiglottis, again, epi means above. Remember, epidermis means above or on top of. So the opening between the vocal folds is referred to as the, glo as the glottis or the glottic opening. So the epiglottis will lie on top of and cover the glottis. Again, the opening between the vocal folds and prevent food and water from going down uh, your throat and blocking your airway. The rima glottidis or glottic opening is formed by a pair of mucose membranes called the vocal folds. Uh, these are the true vocal cords, sometimes called vocal cords, but they're not cords, they're flaps of skin. The vocal folds are situated high in the larynx, just below where the larynx and esophagus split off from the pharynx. And uh, there are lots of videos to show how this work, although it's kind of hard because they vibrate so quickly to see uh, in, in real time what it looks like. But here the vocal folds are open, so this person is taking a breath. When they go to speak, this these folds will move in. Excuse me, these folds will move in here, and this opening will become very narrow. And the air that rushes through that narrow opening or glottis will cause the vocal folds to vibrate. And of course, that vibration is what creates sound and our voice. And uh, that is how we speak. Cilia in the upper respiratory tract move mucus and trap particles down towards the pharynx. So if you have dust or pollen grains and they are in the upper respiratory tract, the cilia will move them down so that you can swallow them and uh, digest them and get them out of your airway. And then if the opposite is true, cilia in the lower respiratory tract will move them upward. So they'll go through the larynx and move up into your airway so that you can either cough, sneeze them out, or then swallow them and digest them. As air passes from the larynopharynx into the larynx, it leaves the upper respiratory tract and enters the lower respiratory tract. And this is going to be the end of our discussion on uh, this video lesson one, because we're getting ready to move into the lower respiratory tract. And this is a good place to stop. All right, that is going to conclude 
today's video lesson. So if we are remote, then you will be directed to the Schoology page to go take your exit slip. Um, if we're not on remote and you're watching this because you're quarantined and you're at home, um, there won't be an exit slip, but hopefully uh, you were able to uh, keep up with us here in class by getting your information from this video. So thanks for watching. And since I'm a YouTuber now, I have to say it. Uh, don't forget to click like and subscribe. Talk to you later.